information and global navigation satellite system. Define success on your own terms, achieve it by your own rules, and build a life you are proud to live. I am profusely delighted to take an opportunity to introduce and welcome a woman of distinct vision and founding head of Illuminating Ideas, Dr. Nisha Radha Krishnan Ma'am, Associate Professor, Department of Civil Engineering, NIT, Trishra Palli. This extraordinary personality does not need any introduction at all. A noble woman with a character of great height. She has a unique academic background with PhD in Global Positioning System and Master's degrees in Remote Sensing from Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. She has strong tradition of pursuing excellence of research experience in application of geospatial technology in urban planning with emphasis to land use, land cover assessment, quantifying the urban sprawl, analyzing the relation between land use and travel demand, site suitability, analysis for urban residential development, land use transportation interaction, GIS-based payment management system, and land use-based urban planning, and modeling of water supply and sewage pipeline distribution using geospatial techniques. She is closely associated with the transportation division of the Department of Civil Engineering in NIT Trishapalli. She carried out impactful projects worth rupees 2.2 crores in the domain of land use, land cover assessment, urban planning, transport planning, and ITS. She has completed one DST sponsored project as principal investigator and one project sponsored by Center of Excellence in Urban Transport, Department of Civil Engineering, IIT Madras, and Ministry of Urban Development as COPI. She is also one of the core member of MHRD Government of India sponsored Center of Excellence in Transportation Engineering at NIT Trichrapalli. She has guided over 24 PG projects over the last eight years. She has published her research, pro uh, research outputs in leading journals like Journal Geological Society of India, Journal of Indian Society of Remote Sensing, Journal of Remote Sensing, and GIS, and so on. She has pub published n number of national and international publications in research areas of GPS, remote sensing, GIS in urban planning, geospatial technology, and so on. She is an active member of Institution of Engineers, India Society of Remote Sensing, Indian Society of Geomatics, and Indian Geotechnical Society. We are certainly grateful to her for accepting our invitation humbly and gladly to become the guest speaker for this session. We are really thankful to an idol of knowledge, Dr. Nisha Radha Krishnan Ma'am, for taking the time out of her busy schedule to present this session. On behalf of Department of Civil Engineering, I welcome you, Ma'am. Participants, we are looking forward on your active participation. I ensure the session will be profitable and fruitful for everyone present here. Welcome you, one and all. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time to our guest speaker, the sculpture of human character, Dr. Nisha Radha Krishnan Ma'am. Over to you, Ma'am. Yeah, good. Good morning. Am I audible to all? Yes, Ma'am. Yes, Ma'am. Yes, Ma'am. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Nisha, for a very wonderful uh, uh, introduction. And uh, your name and my names are, are almost similar. So uh, very nice present, I mean, way of uh, introducing somebody. So I'm very much honored. And uh, welcome to all the participants of today. It's been a five day long process for you. So, uh, um, and uh, I would like to first thank the HOD for having given me this opportunity. So without any further delay, I think I would start my presentation. I'll just share my screen and you could just inform me whether it is uh, visible or not. Yes, is the screen visible to all? Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, so just for, yeah. So for connectivity purposes, I will just uh, disable my video. So uh, that will be. I'll just see that.
The screen is still visible, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, very clear. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. So uh, moving on to the presentation. Uh, so for the next uh, maybe one 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 hour forty five minutes or so. i will be trying to explain about a, a little bit of basics of gps maybe it has been a repetition for uh, one and all but still a little bit of case studies and all that that we've been trying to do in our campus uh, I'll, i'll be just going through that so uh, we so as um, uh, nisha had mentioned i'm the associate professor in the department of civil engineering from uh, nit trichy and uh, she had mentioned i had done my um, phd from iit bombay in the field of gps where we had tried to adopt a very unique surveying application in structural analysis so maybe i'll give you a gist of how we had done that now kind of like i've entirely shifted my field to urban planning but uh, still gps is my um, core area and uh, i will just try to mention what all things we've been doing and what we had done in the past so uh, yeah so before i move ahead i would first like to dedicate this presentation and my entire career to my, my uh, guide who is uh, professor madhavan kulkarni who is uh, unfortunately no more uh, he i would say is the pioneer or the father of bringing in gps into academics so uh, the global positioning system and all that was with the industry and with the um, organization government organization like isro dst and all that but bringing this into the academics into the research was none other than madhavan kulkarni and uh, that's the first and i would always try to put him as one of my uh, the first slides uh, in any of my presentations okay so moving on to this gps now the realization of gps is nothing but from the word geodesy now whenever we talk about surveying we don't much use geodesy as our word but actually you could say that surveying is a part of geodesy you could even if you go into foreign organizations you won't find surveying and leveling as one of the topics it will be geospatial it will be either geodesy or it would be geodynamic something of that sort so basically whenever i take for my btech students i avoid using the word surveying i say geodesy and surveying is nothing but it is geodesy so uh, the realization of surveying is analyzing or any measurements that is related to the earth so when we talk about surveying the first thing is we say finding out the position of a point on the surface of the earth but we don't say what is on the earth we say earth is a plane surface earth is round and all that but geodesy is slightly different it is you are trying to determine the exact shape the size the gravity field of the earth all that now why is that necessary because nowadays we have so many modern equipments we have cars which are having navigation equipments in it now this navigation equipment should take you to the correct place if it doesn't take you to the correct place you are at the wrong place so how do you come to the correct place you need precise coordinates if you are using simple surveying you won't get the correct coordinates so to get a get precise position you need to do first what is the size what is the shape what is the dimension of the earth all that and this is done nothing but by using geodesy the second major application of geodesy is accurate mapping of the earth surface like how your map has been created how is the globe created how is that x y z calculated how is the lat long calculated all that will come under some field of geodesy third thing is datum we always talk about a datum now how is the datum created all that then from school we have analyzed uh, or we have studied that the earth rotates from west to east it is moving uh, 360 i mean it is moving around an axis and all that how does it rotate what is the speed of rotation in what angle it rotates all that can be analyzed in geodesy the next major application of geodesy is crustal motion now the earth is always moving away again we in school we have learned that the continents were together once then they broke apart and then they went into different uh, directions so how did that happen so that is again one more analysis right so 
that is one thing then finally now for all these purposes we have what is ground based and space based observations now in ground based observations you have nothing but your plane survey and space based observations is nothing but your uh, gps then uh, other kind of activities like uh, other vslr other kind of communications uh, satellites and all that so uh, your plane surveying total station all that will come under ground based so all these things when you put together it becomes geodesy so for geodesy or for total station or for let us say theod light or for any surveying application the first and foremost thing that we need to understand is what is data every time that uh, we may have learnt in our surveying classes that the height is always measured from a data which is parallel to the earth surface now how is that calculated how do you measure the datum from the earth surface all that again comes as a part of geodesy there's a lot of mathematical calculations involved in that and when you go in depth into all those analysis we basically come across two different kinds of date um, height measurements so uh, the measurements that we do for plane surveying we call it as geodetic height it is because the earth surface is uh, rough right and uh, actually the shape of the earth is not round it is ellipsoid so the gps observations are taken from the ellipsoid to the uh, regular i mean whichever height you want to measure and the geoidal height is nothing but your regular datum that you use for leveling there is a mean sea level so there are two different height observations and that's requires actually an entire session for explanation so here i would not be going into that but what you need to understand is that for geo the uh, the analyzing or fixing of the datum is done using a major application of uh, geodesy okay okay now let us come to the actual thing gps now uh, gps is uh, not new in the sense the very first gps was introduced in the year 1970s of course it was done by the us um, and uh, they had very colloquially named it as navstar gps now this uh, navstar gps has a full form it is called navigation satellite timing and ranging and uh, it's a radio based navigation system here what the satellite does is that it gives out a signal those radio waves will pass through the atmosphere it will be captured by your receiver and then you will get your observations nowadays the mobile phone is one of the best gps equipments that are available so the major advantage of these kind of equipments is that it gives you worldwide coverage so wherever you stand the signals will be received by the equipment and then you can get the coordinates you be in any part of the world you be inside the building or you be outside the building wherever it may be there is always coverage it's a 24 bar 7 365 days coverage all throughout then it's a all weather operation now when we are using normal surveying ground based equipments the major problem that we observe is that weather is an issue most of the time whenever we take lab classes for our students they be very happy when it starts raining so and then what happens you have to wind it up and then come back to the um, department but here that is the thing for gps weather is not an issue you can use it at any time then there is always continuous signals continuous signals in the sense if there is any problem in the form of an earthquake or if it's uh, high rain or anything of that sort the signals never get disconnected always signals are available so these are the advantages of uh, gps then it is used for navigation like your google map your uh, google uh, uh, what do you say navigation system that you adopt all that comes and it, you can navigate it gives you position it gives you lat long height so 3d it gives you 3d and one more important thing in uh, gps is that it gives you the time at which the observation is taken which somehow when we do normal surveying we forget to 
take you may take an observation during serving but you forget to note the time now the time is very important because if you are doing time series analysis like today you've taken observation after 10 15 years you take your observation the time is important in the sense what i'm saying is that in if i have taken observation at 9 o'clock today after 10 years i should be taking it at 9 o'clock because uh, atmosphere also has an effect on all the observation so time factor is a very important component and that is again obtained using gps technology important without which gps we cannot exist so the first it is divided into three segments the most important segment being the space segment so the space segments would be the satellites uh, and you have a set of satellites which are above us and uh, it is kind of like moving all throughout continuously and these space segments their control or their um, health and whether they are drifted away or not is uh, what you say adjusted by what is called the control segment so these small small units are put up everywhere in the uh, world the main headquarters being in the us then we have small small uh, what you say control segments all throughout the world and these will monitor whether the segments are okay or not now we as users are not at all interested in the first two because there is something which is being taken care by somebody else so what is of interest to us is nothing but the user segment and the user segment is a wide wide spectrum and that is where we make use of this spectrum to analyze some applications so we will just see what are these various segments so the very first segment is the constellation of satellites uh like i was said it is uh, a global coverage and the peculiar thing about this constellation is that there initially there were about 24 satellites as i was mentioning the us were the only ones who were in the game and they had sent off 24 satellites and they had arranged this in such a way that it is adjusted in six planes so at a time you can see minimum so if i am sitting over here giving a presentation i will have four satellites minimum over my head so and gps will only work if there are four satellites otherwise it will not function so that is how it has been arranged and it has got a 12 hour circular orbit in the sense that every 12 hours it will come back to the same spot and how do we identify gps from other remote sensing satellites is by its height so the altitude at which the orbit is set which is 20200 kilometers uh, remote sensing satellites will be in the range of let's say 700 to 1000 kilometers then you have other set of satellites which are called geostationary satellites which is at a height of 36000 so that is how these satellites are identified then it has a inclination of 55 degree it has two bands in the sense the radio signal what is being sent will be of two frequencies now these two frequencies will carry information you have l1 and l2 the l1 frequency will carry the position of the satellite in space which is important which i'll be coming to it later and the l2 signal will con contain information about the atmosphere now what i mean to say is that the radio signal has to travel through the atmosphere so in the atmosphere it has to pass through the ionosphere it has to pass through the troposphere so the signal bends and what is the uh, strength of the ionosphere what is the strength of the troposphere all that information will be available in the l2 so these two signals are what is being released by the satellite it will be captured by your uh, equipment and thus you get your latitude longitude or where you are staying now all that i'll be explaining as i move forward so this is that of the satellites and uh, these are just very a few things in the sense uh, it's not much importance to any one of us but still uh, this is a statistics now these statistics would vary based from country to country this is for the us and uh, these are the first of the type gps equipments uh, gps satellites which have been released uh, it's circling the earth surface 
and uh, various blocks of uh, different satellites, uh, the different shapes and all those things. Yeah. Then control segment are those uh, monitor stations, ground antennas and master control stations which are spread across the world and this will monitor the health of the uh, satellite system. Yeah, so what is actually important to us is the GPS receivers. Now, as I was saying, one of the best equipment that we have now is our mobile phone. So almost all mobile phones are having uh, GPS embedded in it. So based on the, um, what do you say, the cost of the equipment, the, the app also changes. So we have, based on application, the following are the uh, type of equipments. You have handled or military receivers, which would come around the cost of 20,000 plus. And uh, your simple mobile phone will come under the handle. Mostly we use the mobile phone for navigating in our car. You just use Google map. So the best thing that you would have observed, which you may can as well try it out yourself. You just try out using a slightly cheaper mobile phone and a very expensive mobile phone. Like I would say you go for an Apple and you go for a simple 5000 Nokia phone and all that. You will see the difference in your navigation. See, the thing that we say is that the higher the cost, better would be the accuracy. So you want to get a very good position of yours with less error, go for a higher cost. If you want just an okay, okay position of yours, you go for a lesser cost. So that is how this GPS uh, business works. The uh, industry, they will try to talk to you regarding which is best and best and all. But what you should understand is when you want to buy an equipment, you first think what should be your application. If you are very much only into a simple plain kind of analysis, you can as well go for a cheaper equipment. If you are going for simply a map making equip, uh, uh, receiver, you can go for something which is between one to five lakhs. If you are going for some very precise, uh, uh, like uh, if your uh, uh, equipment where it will give you very, very precise observations which should have less error, then you go for a very high cost equipment which would even come from eight to 10 to even 50 lakhs. So, from the academic point of view, usually the first three are the ones that are adopted. That's why the next three I have not given much cost. Real-time DGPS is also used, but from the academic point of view, it is of limited application. So that's what. So with the cost comes the accuracy and uh, you have to decide which equipment you need based on your application. Don't get fooled by the industry people where they keep on telling you, okay, this is best, this is best. Adjust your budget based on your application. Then we have a single frequency and dual frequency receivers. Your mobile phone has single frequency in the sense it works only on that L1 frequency. Dual frequency, it works on both L1 and L2. And uh, like what happens is when I was saying the L1 has to pass through a set of atmosphere. So when it passes through the atmosphere, it bends. Some of them get scattered. So by the time it reaches your equipment, there will be error. So how do you tackle that error? That error is tackled by the L2, which will give you information about the atmosphere. So when these two augment together, you get less error, right? So that's where single frequency, dual frequency. Single frequency is a bit cheaper. Dual frequency, you will not get anything less than 8 lakhs. So that's where it comes, the geodetic receivers. That's what I've mentioned. So the first two are L1. This third one is um, L1 and L2. OK, and the cost anyway, if I'm talking in rupees, you can have from 15,000 to, like I said, 50,000. Even now, LIDARs are with uh, GPS. So that, again, it comes to uh, 60 lakhs, 62 lakhs. You have those. Uh, high-tech uh, scanner equipments also embedded with GPS, which is, I guess, coming up to 70 lakhs and all that. So that is the kind of the range. And with the cost, of course, the accuracy will also improve. So you have, now here I mentioned only MM level, but now we have equipments which will give you sub-millimeter level accuracy. Okay. And uh, these are some of the equipments uh, which uh, are available in the market. Now they are modified also quite a lot. You have Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, all those things. 
and um, the very first uh, equipment uh, i'm sorry uh, uh, this is uh, see yeah so this is a gps uh, yeah so the, the for what i see over here the one that i'm showing in the pointer is a small handled equipment which is of a maglin this will give you only the coordinates and uh, what i see here on the left side or this entire bunch is a geodetic equipment so these equipments are fixed on to either a structure or they are fixed on to your trains like nowadays majority of the metro trains they have gps equipments fixed on to it which will tell you which is the next station so all that how is it possible it is possible because they have these equipments with them and these are some of the modern type of equipments now that are available in the market geodetic receivers now all these are costly but uh, they have their own very good applications available now this is a simple uh, what do you say a coca cola can but then when you go next to the next screen you will be quite surprised in the sense it has got a gps equipment so these are the kind of things that have been adopted now now if see whenever i take class for my btech and mtech students i give a lot of reference to some movies where gps equipments are used so maybe i can also do the same thing over here i can just tell you what all things see the kind of the movies now you know they kind of like uh, what do you say forecast those equipments that may come in the future you will see see lot of gps equipments being used in these uh, uh in these movies now if you see there are certain movies where the prisoners have been put up with a belt at the ankle of their foot so that they don't jump a particular line so that again is a gps embedded uh, uh, what do you say uh, anklet so they have put it in such a way that the person when he jumps a certain periphery or a buffer it starts beeping and the person the prisoner's uh, position is obtained or then you put a small beacon inside a person's uh, blood vessel they can know the position of the person so in many countries they do that they just embed a small gps chip into the skin of the prisoner then in the case of animal and all that how to get the count of all the animals now in many in most of the times we see in the newspaper that they give us the correct number of wild life present in a certain forest now it's not that they go to the forest and then they count the number of uh, these animals it's nothing like that they either they are put up with a collar having a gps chip or you have a small beacon which is put into the blood of the animal so likewise they get to know what is the position so all that has the application of gps now these examples that i'm telling you are very not very old but it's been there for the past 10 to 15 years now there are lot many applications that have come up and now smart city has city option has taken up this gps is one of its uh, thrust for many like smart mobility smart houses all that has got gps embedded in it okay yes so the major principle of uh, gps is like this that you i was as i was mentioning you require a minimum of four satellites now the now i have s1 s2 s3 and s4 now this s1 will have its position like sx1 ys and z1 so that is where the l1 frequency will give the information out so the signal is released by the equipment you have a receiver at the bottom where the position is not known this is u p is u and it will give out a signal this signal will develop an equation like this r1 r1 is the distance then you have this equation right so and uh, c is the speed of light tr is the uh, time at which it is released and tt is the time at which the uh, signal is received by the signal i mean by the receiver so using this equation you can create three equations and you have three unknowns you get x y and z now the question is why do i need a fourth equip uh, satellite now this fourth satellite is for basically we say it is for time measurement but it is not for that purpose it is also for that purpose and also for time measurement the uh, 
there is an atomic clock which is present in the satellite same way there will be an atomic clock in the equipment the satellite is a very expensive equipment so obviously the atomic clock will give you measurements in micro mini nano second or whatever it is but the receivers are again ranging from eight uh, what do you say 10000 to like i'm saying 70 lakhs so based on the cost the accuracy of the clock will also vary lesser choice equipments will have a clock which will not be able to measure very accurately so what happens there will be a delay in the time so to correct that time we need the fourth satellite and that is where this correction is delta tr so all this put together will give me x y z and time so this is a basic principle of gps now there is one more thing in gps surveying the basic application of surveying is triangulation i hope all of you know what is triangulation if you it's a set of triangles if you have to find out the position of an unknown point you should have at least two known points and with that we find out the position of the satellite now the reason and gps is triangulation from space now why all the surveying has shifted from the ground to space is because of this main reason if these four satellites s1 s2 s3 and s4 were on the ground and my point is also on the ground just imagine that and this an earthquake so you will be adopting s1 s2 s3 s4 to find out p if all these four points are also affected by earthquake then the point p that you get is not accurate at all that is why all these known points are shifted above this because they are not affected by the earthquake and thus you get what is the fourth point right so this is a basic principle of gps gps is triangulation from space the idea is the known points are not affected by other post errors they are precise using their precise position you get the position Okay. Am I audible? I am getting a lot of uh, disturbance from the side. I get yeah. Audience, can you please mute your mics? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Muted, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um. Yeah. so the final products of uh, gps uh, these are the products finally that you get now once your observations are taken there are some dedicated softwares which will help you in doing all these calculations now majority of the uh, softwares are in the equipment itself you don't have to use a separate software in your pc many of the things are embedded with the equipment itself so the finally you, what you will get is you will get the first three either it will be in the form of xyz latitude longitude height easting north thing height now these three are different coordinate systems we have what is called cartesian coordinate geodetic coordinate and all that so that varies from country to country and we adopt the second one that is latitude longitude height and you can adjust your software to give you in whatever form you need so the basic product that you get from gps is the first three things and the other are other secondary information if you require like uh, some may require orbit information some studies may require clock correction some may require atmospheric information those are all other dedicated applications if and if required only so that's one of the things so these are some of the gps observations results that you finally get then there are different types of uh, gps observations based on the application so the very first observation is called absolute positioning so absolute positioning is you have only one receiver like your mobile phone so uh, this one single receiver observing four sets of satellites here you will have some error it will not be very accurate it will be between 10 to 12 tmm so it means that if i take an observation now of myself at this point i'll get some latitude longitude height now how do i know i have an error is you have google earth you have google map 
you have GIS software. You just try to merge your position on the Google Earth and see where you are. You will be surprised that your position will not match the position on the Google map. It will lie a little bit away, like that's what I'm saying, 10 to 20 meters away from the uh, observation. So uh, this is what is called absolute positioning. And we use it only for small things like navigation, not for very precise observation, just for an okay, okay analysis. Then you have what is called relative positioning. So this is where your basis of surveying is, where you have two receivers observing the same set of satellites. So it means if there is an error from one set, the same error will also come in the other set. And then you can subtract these two, the error will be eliminated. Simple basis of surveying. So this is what is called relative positioning. So you have, if there is some error in this satellite, this error will come in both the receivers. If you subtract both these errors from this, it will get minimized. So this is what is called relative positioning. That's simple basis of surveying. Then you have differential GPS. So differential GPS is where you have one master station using the master st uh, or the base station we will take observations to a set of satellites you will correct all the errors over there then the other stations will be analyzed with respect to this precise station so that is what is called differential gps so all the errors somehow get eliminated now this master station will be monitored for a longer period of time like it will be something which is monitored 365 days a year and the two other stations which we call as rover will be observed maybe only for a minute or for five minutes or for 10 minutes or maybe for a few hours like that. So that is what is called differential GPS. Kinematic GPS is on the move. One GPS is fixed on a moving equipment. So like if you are moving in a car, it becomes a kinematic GPS. Then uh, with respect to accuracies, more the distance, lesser will be the accuracy, which is again a basis of surveying itself. Uh, if your baseline length is between 10 to 100 kilometer, uh, your uh, accuracy will be limited, uh, 0.3 to 4 mm. Likewise, if you go on increasing the baseline length, the accuracy will vary. This is again one basis of surveying itself, but these are the observations that were undertaken by uh, IIT Bombay when they had uh, done some analysis and this is the kind of observations that they had done. Okay. Now, some major problems with GPS um, is selective availability. Now, this somehow has been switched off from 1st May 2000 uh, during uh, um, the President Bill Clinton's time. So, what the catch was over here, now since the US is always modern and high tech and it's always first to for every um, activity so they had brought about the GPS now this GPS they had very cunningly what they had done is the signals that are sent by the equipment was encrypted in the encrypted in the sense only the US defense would get they what they had done they put a bug in the observation so the signals if it is used by the US they get the correct position of any place in the world because it is their satellite. So they can sit at the headquarters and get the position of any single observation in the world. But if we are trying to use the GPS signals and try to get the position of some other place, we will have an error of at least minimum 10 to 20 mm or even in centimeters or meters. Why? Because the bug will corrupt or encrypt that signal. It doesn't give you the correct position. It gives you something far away. So this is what is called selective availability, which was somehow removed in May 2000, but still, it is still encrypted to a certain point that we do not get the full frequency all the time. So this is what was is one of the, one of the problems in GPS in certain level 90% it has been removed, but 10% it's not been removed, but it is not been told fully that it has been removed. Okay, so that's called selective availability. The other one is non-spoofing, uh, that is non-availability of, this is the same thing as I was mentioning before. 
then availability of gps signal in the sense denial of the signal during conflict selectively switching off over a region signal jamming in a ground place all that is again one of the issues so you can put a jammer and stop it military people they do that some signals are like if you see jammu and kashmir they have removed of the um, signal there is always a conflict of signal so all that is one of the other problems in gps so there are other problems as well in the sense you have gps signals you cannot use it in a very crowded area in the sense if you have very high rise buildings or if you have uh, thick forest gps signals and cannot be obtained uh, very clearly then uh, initially they used to be that you cannot use it in cars but now it is possible earlier the gps signals could not pass through concrete structures but now it is possible the mobile phones have been made uh, suitable for that purpose but then only a mobile phone will work if you use a gps receiver inside the building you will observe it will not catch any signals only mobile phones have been encrypted to capture those radio signals in the building the radio signals somehow get obstructed by the concrete blocks so then you the gps signals can also get uh, swayed away if you have strong electric lines running across the area then uh, you have uh certain things like uh, um, yeah then you have water body if you have a water body somewhere near your equipment the signal will strike the water body and then it will come back to the equipment so what happens is the length of the line or the signal will be increase so all those are some small minor errors which can be removed if you are very careful in fixing the equipment and all those things so next is the gps now where the applications so those were the basics now we will really go into the application of gps and where india stands in the uh, gps scenario so the application is virtually in all spheres of developmental activities gps has found its name in survey in mapping in navigation in land in air uh, then in oceans revenue mapping earth rotation and i would say that india is not far behind when it is coming to all these uh, things initially we were at the back seat but then now india has really moved forward with many of its applications and now uh, the mhrd is very keen on many um or is say on isro they have brought up so many projects for uh, gps applications Mm, then a few of them in seismic tectonic studies in analyzing plate motion regional and crustal movement earthquake hazard estimation so all this i will be trying to just explain in a few then gps gis integration so uh, the in gis one of the major input is uh, gps so the they do integrated analysis then gps for photographic mapping if you see google earth Google Earth is a very good example of this GPS, GIS, and remote sensing integration. You have the GIS platform. On the GIS platform, you have the remote sensing image, and the position of each of those features on that Google map is nothing but your GPS. So they do go together, and uh, we collectively call this as 3S technology. Take up the SS, SS, and then go ahead. Yes. Then you have uh, what is called a GPS aided survey. surveillance now this is a very common thing now if you see a balloon you just be careful it could have a gps now all this artificial intelligence and all those things have come up you don't know who is monitoring you at what time yeah now if you really go into many of the net observe, net and all you will not find the word gps it will be called gnss like i was saying since gps was the only set of satellites that were present in the uh, un in space and it was us based and since us had encrypted their information in such a way that the others were not getting observation other countries also started following suit so they started sending their own satellites so some of the other two satellites are glonus which is by russia where india is also partnering along with uh, the russia then galileo which has been given out by euro and india is also not far behind it has released already one uh, gps satellite it's been delayed quite a lot but then they have also india is also uh, following uh, suit in this so all this collectively it is called 
global navigation satellite system nothing but gnss uh so when gps and glonass if you have uh, see you had gps 24 satellites and minimum four so there is one more thing in gps more the number of satellites see more the number of satellites better will be the accuracy so that is another basic thing that we say like when you do surveying you have more the number of observations you have three observations you have six observations of a one single place you take three observations you average it you take six observations you average it the one that you have six observation average will be more accurate and precise than three so the same thing is adopted here more the number of satellites more will be the accuracy then you have uh, launching of galileo uh, which was again done by europe uh, which uh, they had sent uh, for commercial for public service purposes and all that and the advantage is that you have more visibility now uh, this is the visibility for gps at some point of time you will see the observations like this but then here you will have every time there will be signals so this is what is called gps signal a uh, thing okay now some general applications of uh, gps technology first thing is in surveying and mapping so uh, in land survey of course when you are going for any survey the first thing that you need to find out is what is the latitude and longitude of that area there is a reason for that uh, if you are taking observations now and you have taken the coordinate after 10 15 years if you want to revisit the area you should know exactly where you have to go so that lat long which you had taken 10 years before will help you to come to the exact point because surveying is that you should always have precise observations without which it is not possible to do so then marine survey so marine survey is uh, the movement of ships earlier the movement of ship was that it used to use more scored or it was looking at the stars the ships used to navigate themselves by looking at the position of the stars celestial survey that's what we call a celestial survey but nowadays every equipment every ship has got a radar it has got gps and so it can easily navigate itself and go then geographic information system one major application is uh, gps is an input into geographic information system mapping uh you can use your uh, high tech mobile phone to track your route and do mapping seismology it can be used for i wouldn't say for earthquake prediction or earthquake detecting but it can be used for some purpose in seismology then getting precise position precise position is very much important when it comes to military where uh, in case uh, they want to really see now if we have observed or uh, they used to use tanks and all for uh, army used to use tanks and all for bombing but and they used to fix up a tragic tree for uh, what do you say releasing the military bombs but nowadays it's not like that you may find bombs where you just have to fit in the latitude longitude of the place it will automatically go to that area based on that latitude and longitude but how do you do that you need to know what is the precise position so to find out the precise position you need to have some high tech equipment to do that so that is where gps is used then uh, these are some of the gps equipments which are fitted on to the uh, areas like uh, yeah himalaya so one major application in india of gps is the himalayan height so there is an institute which is called wadia institute of technology which is situated up to the one second just hold on please and then i can bring the book yeah so wadia institute of technology the wadia institute of technology what they have they have a set of uh, gps stations which are fitted these are antennas which i am showing and these antennas are monitored 365 days a 365 days a week right so uh these observations are taken and then they are analyzed and the coordinates are obtained now these equipments uh, will the ones that are set up in the himalayas they are able to 
take observations. Uh, just one second, just hold on, please. Hmm. So these observations which are taken, now what it does is that it finds what is the height today. Then it will tell me what is the height in another six months. So when you do that, you just have to subtract the coordinates. When you subtract the coordinates, it will give you what is the height. So they say that every year the Himalayas height is decreasing, or sorry, increasing. Now, how is it increasing? Uh, that is again obtained using GPS technology. Right. Then, yes, one of the recent applications of GPS is finding out how the structure is moving. Nowadays, you will find high-rise buildings and dams and all that having GPS equipment. So, see, the problem with structural equipment is that they are embedded inside the equipment. So, in due course of time, you, can, you won't have access to any of those equipments. So, these equipments, and sometimes what happens is when it stops working, you have to restart it all over again, and it is different to calibrate. In the, at that particular point of time, you can make use of these equipments and then find out what is the movement of structure. So this I'll be giving you an example and uh, maybe you will get an idea. Then it is used for so many other community based uh, applications. Then uh, for movement of tractors, all equipments will have GPS embedded in it. Then cellular phones is one major example. And uh, then you have uh, in avionics. Yes, in avionics. Uh, in now, many of the aeroplanes are now flying using this uh, GPS. So you'll be even surprised to know that nowadays you have flights uh, which are autopiloted. Now, how does the autopilot know? They just fix up the uh, GPS and it will tell you where it has to go. So that is how the stuff works. Right. Then uh, you have uh, commercial force aviation. In marine. So marine you have recreational observation, commercial, tidal areas, offshore drilling and ship navigation. This I had already explained to you stating that um, uh, like instead of making use of the uh, celestial satellites or in the case of uh, uh, what do you say uh, the most code this kind uh, uh, the gps equipments will tell you what the thing is yes now tidal studies is that in, you have boeing so on the boeing the gps equipment is fitted and these gps equipments will tell what is the uh, change in the tide how much is the tide increased and decreased? Precisely how much tide has risen today and how much it has come down. Then military, of course, it has been used for quite a bit of a time to find out inaccessible areas, to find out the different routes. And there are special equipments just for this purpose. Tracking and communication. Now, somehow these GPS, remote sensing, and GIS finds its application very much in transportation engineering, not much in structural, though in environmental, let us write of a bit. But uh, in transportation engineering, it has been used profound. So you have these tracking systems. So one of the best examples of the tracking systems would be your Amazon, Flipkart, and all that. So you will find that. Uh, if you even use Amazon, it will tell you exactly where your parcel is. So that is, again, one tracking system where the GPS has been adopted. Then you have public transit. So you have your Ola and Uber. Again, your Ola and Uber, it's, it tells you where the location of your Ola and Uber is at this particular point of time. The map will tell you which vehicle you have to go, all that. Then you have automatic vehicle location and dispatch. Public safety in the sense if you there is an emergency in the form of an earthquake, or if there is a fire, the information goes to the headquarters and they will send you, they, the headquarters will locate where the problem is and then they will locate a uh, shortest path so that they can come to that particular area. Um, uh, Kanan sir, can I just get a two minute break? I'll be back. 
Hello, uh, Kannan sir. Participants, I'll be back in a minute. Okay, just I'll just come in two minutes. Yes, one. in uh, civil engineering gps uh, is been used profusely for deformation studies may mostly to monitor horizontal and vertical crustal motion and is a very accurate and reliable method so in india mostly gps was initially adopted for these applications like crustal deformation and structural deformation and some of the basic studies were done by survey of india then later it was taken over it was done by the uh, some another uh, institutions like i was saying wadi institute then you have indian institute of geomagnetics which is situated in the us all that yes and these are some of the equipments which are companies which are very popular in india and some of the popular ones are trimble lyca topcon these are the three main companies where you will find uh, they have a very good business in uh, india and uh, they provide many of these robust uh, gps receivers for many applications then there are dedicated softwares nowadays available with the equipment but then if you want to do some scientific high precise uh, gps studies there are some dedicated softwares where you have bernies gamut geo now that and some of the two majorly adopted softwares in india are these the first two bernies and gamut some of them are the some versions are obtained open source but then it is restricted in certain areas uh, of usage but um, you can easily contact them and get the software but these like i was saying many of the equipments come with dedicated softwares these softwares are required over those dedicated softwares and any analysis in gps has to follow the basis of surveying you need to know uh, uh, the you need to create a network first either in the global level or regional level or local level and in the global level we prefer to have permanent or semi permanent gps stations because you cannot go there and then keep on setting the equipment all the time because global means from one part of the world to the other part of the world or one part of the country to the other part of the country so they should be fixed all the time it should be measured and uh, that's what is called global or regional network then you have local networks are the networks which you can easily go observe and take the observation so you can set it you can remove it you can go back again set it so those are what are called local networks but this is a prerequisite for gps analysis 
without that uh, there's no point in uh, really going ahead with any gps observations and uh, when it comes to international gps networks there are more than 380 to even 400 plus now i would say and they are uh, all put up all throughout the uh, entire world and india also has two uh, stations as a part of the igs and uh, one is situated at isc the civil department the uh, main uh, terrace of isc bangalore and the other one is in hyderabad so these two come under the part of the international gps network and what is the role of these two is that if, like i was saying the crustal motion of the entire world now every continent is moving one against each other like they say the himalaya is growing because two plates are striking against each other so you have an indian plate you have the tibetan plate these two plates when they meet together the himalaya is getting created so at what speed they are moving at what direction they are moving that is analyzed using this network of international gps so that gives you the plate motion how the continents are moving away or moving towards so this is done by the international gps network system then this is a plate motion of different plates of the entire continent you can see india here it is this isc bangalore so this is like this the indian plate is moving towards the tibetan plate in the northeast direction so for every continent they it has been analyzed by the uh, ig stations and this is very important as well because if there is a change in the direction of one plate then you can predict that some major problem is going to happen in the future because every plate will act as a pressure cooker so at one point of time when there is a small change in the direction it will burst and when it bursts it means that an earthquake will happen so that is what is called uh, the plate motion estimated from ig station then uh, there are many national gps networks and uh, india is also having a very good indian gps network for geomagnetic uh, studies and uh, there are other indo hungary many projects are available and uh, they were working line side by side hungary and also is there Uh, then uh, there are a lot of geomagnetic programs which have been sponsored by uh, dst isro and now even scrb uh, is also sponsoring many projects smart city concepts all these are coming under the uh, geomagnetic programs uh, okay then these are some of the permanent gps stations uh, situated all around uh, the indian subcontinent where you have one in bangalore and every every basic state has its own permanent station so these permanent stations will tell what is the movement of the indian plate and you will find majority of them along the himalayan belt because this is where the major issue is so there you will see lot many and then another one is here now after the tsunami in 2004 there are bunch of uh, equipments in the andaman and also along the chennai border so uh, these equipments will analyze whether another tsunami would come or not yeah so i like i was mentioning that i'll be giving you a certain set of examples where gps has been adopted by some analysis studies so one major study which was undertaken by the survey of india dst and also by some organizations such as ngri uh, then indian institute of geomagnetics uh, then uh, the uh, trivandrum cs um, cse all those this is one very good study now this dam is very famous in the sense it has a structure which is quite strong it is a 85 meter high dam and uh, it is presumed to have been set up over a fault area which somehow was only known after uh, it an earthquake struck which is a very uh, major earthquake in 1967 of a very high magnitude 6.3 but the unique part of this is that even after the earthquake the dam did not have much of a damage it is standing intact and even till today people still do observe minor uh, earthquakes which i would also say even we had gone as a part of our study there and we also felt an earthquake in that area and people believe that it is because of the earthquake the fault is unstable and lot of studies have been done right from the time of 1960 70s 
for uh, this purpose. So the observed seismic activity, people say, is reservoir induced. They say that because of the heavy weight of the water behind the dam, this earthquake is uh, taking place. And a lot of studies have been done to study the stability of the structure because the structure is standing intact with very minor uh, uh, cracks only. So uh, IIT Bombay also came became a part of uh, this study and uh, from about 2000 to 2007 till um, Professor Madhavan Kulkarni was um, there, the observations were taken and very surprising good, good results we had observed. So for this purpose, an extensive GPS network comprising of 31 stations were established. Now since this was to study the dam, majority of the dam uh, things were set up on the top of the dam and one point was set up such that it was observing measurements all throughout the analysis and then there was a fault presumed to be a fault and a lot of um, uh, stations were fixed up along the fault then you have the reservoir water and all that and these observations were the observations on these uh, structures were taken periodically so it was taken thrice in a year one was before the monsoon after the monsoon and the other regular so usually it was taken in the month of may september and december so these were the three times when the observations were taken and uh, these were the two equipments that were adopted for observations and it will take observations from eight hours to 24 hours 365 days a week and all that and um, they were taken observations were taken pre-monsoon and post-monsoon yeah so in order to study the deformation of the dam the uh, the stations which were fixed up on the dam structure was taken. The observations were then analyzed and the coordinates were obtained. And then the change in the coordinate between successive campaigns, the campaigns in successive periods were estimated. And here the coordinates um, were analyzed such a way. The first, the coordinates that you obtain from the GPS will be including local deformation and the Indian plate motion. So that is how the analysis was obtain so this was the observation of the dam when the global was taken so we are seeing that the dam is moving in the northeast and it didn't actually give us any information about the movement of the dam so the coordinates when you do a change this is a kind of a, a movement that we obtained it didn't give us any information so we were thinking okay the dam is moving like this but it is not giving us any information how the dam is responding to the water body later when we analyzed we saw a slight change over here between march 05 to june 05 that observation we presumed it was because of the sumatra earthquake there was a small change so it's just a presumption but then in order to verify our observation what we did is we analyzed what was the plate motion so you just took up the ISC observation and then tried to analyze. And uh, when we studied that, we did this, what is called the rate of deformation per year. Now, from the statistics or from many papers and also in contact with the uh, IGS, it was mentioned in several literatures that the movement of the Indian plate is presumed to be 55 mm per year always in the northeast direction so this between 51 to 55 that is what was the actual thing that is given so all the other periods we were getting the observation within the range and in the northeast except for march 05 to june 05 if we had taken the observations during december 2004 maybe we would have got a different answer so this is where GPS can be important. If you have an observation which is running 365 days a week, if you take all the observation, you can even predict if some major problem will come in future. If there is no problem, the movement will be between 51 to 55 northeast. If there is going to be a problem, there will be a slight change away from this. It may go in some other direction and the value may either be more or it may be less. So this can give you a head start towards emergency evacuation 
or some kind of strategy for evacuating an area doing some kind of a strategical analysis so gps can be used as one of the preliminary equipment for any disaster management so gps is very important when it comes to uh, disaster management uh same way we also analyzed between region to region so we found that isc and then um, like if you move down south south will have lesser velocity and as you move towards the extreme north the velocity would be more and land go much in deep into this uh, yeah okay so once uh, as i was showing the global deformation did not give any idea of what was the movement of the dam so we came up with the calculation that global deformation is local deformation plus plate motion so removing the plate motion from the global we got an entirely different picture and when we analyzed that with the change in the water body it gave us what was the actual movement of the dam what happened is september to december there was always uh, how do you say Uh, the uh, reduction and all those things we're seeing a different movement over here see there is a northwest movement there is a rise and increase all that so that gave us what was the variation in the dam so using that what we found is that when there is a rise in the water body it the structure moved towards the upstream uh, sorry towards the downstream in one direction then with a slight reduction in the water it was going back again to its same position and it was always following a certain strategy so the and if you compare it with a threshold you would know whether the dam is safe or not so this was uh, this is one application where you can use it for structural engineering and this does not require so much of an i mean uh, calculations and all that you just need to find out the coordinate compare it with whatever observations you get and you can come up with some kind of a model then a very good application that we observed was seismic analysis of the koina dam now one of the observations that time when we were in koina was an earthquake took place during one particular time which is june 8 2005 very an earthquake of magnitude 4.2 and aftershock 3.6 all of us felt it and our station was running at that time so we came back to the office and then what we th thought is we will just make use of that observation and then do it so we just took out the signal bifurcated it and streamed lined the observation we collected the observation just uh, two hours before the earthquake during the earthquake and after the earthquake so we split it into two to two to two hours and we made use of we just created a graph we saw that before the earthquake the error is less during the earthquake there is a huge peak in the observation so there we were able to know that yes something has happened so this again can be used for some seismic analysis but i wouldn't say that this is the only equipment that can be used for any seismic analysis it can be used along with the seismic the best thing that you can do over here gps is useful it will give you the correct time suppose you it is missed out by the seismograph it will get the precise time of the earthquake so the advantage over here is that it is able to capture small frequency earthquake events dynamic movement of the dam can be studied and in the absence of the seismic data the precise time of occurrence of earthquake can be obtained so this is what was observed then the movement of the dam we analyzed what happened before and after the dam so this was this this is the center of the dam and it was observed that uh, before i mean the uh, before the earthquake i mean during the time uh, observing before uh, the earthquake and the during the time of the earthquake the dam shifted uh in the uh, northwest direction when the earthquake took place so this was about by a certain amount and after the earthquake the dam came back to its original position with the same magnitude so that is what was observed using the data that we obtained what i'm saying is that uh, during the earthquake it shifted by a certain amount in the northwest direction 
and immediately after the earthquake it came back to its original position with the same magnitude so that we were able to analyze using the gps equipment the similarity in the value of displacements and the opposite direction of movement indicated that the dam body rebound back to its original position and thus it was able to show the high elastic property of the dam and this may have been one of the main reasons why in 1967 this dam did not have much damage because the structure was a rubble dam fixed at the bottom and the rubble structure itself took up all the vibration of the um, earthquake and this is one of the reasons why it is still intact and as the earthquake is still taking place it is still so the gps equipment was able to tell us the actual property of the dam which somehow was not been mentioned in any other literatures that we had done so this is all this is one of the greatest work which gps equipment has come out and it has come out from the iit bombay analysis so this could it can be used for other equipments now many high rise buildings are making use of this gps equipment to study the sway of buildings and uh, many uh, earthquake prone areas are also fixing up in japan japan they have very good uh, gps equipments for emergency purposes like during tsunami they know exactly when the tsunami is going to strike and uh, they do evacuation studies in india somehow it's only after the casualties come up that we really think about what we need to do but then now india is also uh, in the run for many, many of the works okay then a uh, lot of other gps gis integration studies have been done you have automobile guidance tracking systems aircraft navigation then you have gps photo management system lot of it is used in highway mapping uh, like you have the uh, pmg sy um, network which again works on gps and gis integrated system a lot of systems have been used for disaster management rescue operation and resource management then lot of ground control analysis for satellite images have also been undertaken uh, then you have vehicle guidance Uh, this is one example uh, which was done at the initial stages now this was done in the year 2001 i think uh, by one of the mtech students of my guide that time the setup was only like this now you have high tech equipments and uh, your google map itself will do everything so uh, it gave a possible route between iit bombay and mumbai airport the the one that you see is the gps uh, tracking uh, line then you can analyze which is the shortest path uh, using gps network uh, then you have a gps integrated system where you can get a vehicle navigation map these are all old images uh, then you can even create a gps gis derived map just by using uh, gps and gis So this is one of the maps which was created by some BTEC students uh, of IIT Bombay using a simple handheld uh, GPS equipment, and then using GIS. Now those times we didn't have our GIS. Um, IIT Bombay had uh, what was called Gram Plus Plus. They had their own uh, software which was generated by IIT Bombay itself. So this they had. It's a commercial software though, pretty cheap software, and um, It, this it was created so you can see very beautifully how the entire iit mumbai campus has been created by using just gps and gis now you have drones and all that for that purpose but uh, this is also one of the applications of uh, gps and gis another major application is the use of lidar lidar though is not very popular in india mostly because of its cost and uh, under the academic uh, option people do get a bit fluttered whether to buy or not because it goes much way above the budget 60 lakhs to 70 lakhs and uh, even touching crores and one issue with lidar is that it has to be fitted onto an aircraft and uh, our avionic uh, policies don't allow private flights to fly even drones also now they have put a stop to the civilian drones so we need to get a, a unique id for even flying uh, drones so uh, considering all those things lidar has not become very popular but it has its very good application if it comes out now you have the ground based lidar which is used for doing a uh, bridge analysis like it will scan the bridge and it will tell you whether there are any cracks or uh, whether there is any distress in the dam structure so lidar is not a very popular yet but maybe in future it will be 
then this is one other application that we have done in nit trichy uh, using of uh, remote sensing gis and gps like i was saying i am closely associated with the transportation division here though my specialization is remote sensing since lot of work is run in the transportation side using this technology i have somehow streamlined to that area so uh, here we have come up with this which is called 3s uh it's taking the ss from all the three remote sensing gis and gps and this has lot of applications in many fields of engineering and uh, this is one of the application where we have used it for payment management system now payment management system is you have many roads and if you really travel along the road you will find some roads are in a very bad shape and some roads are in a very good shape sometimes you will find that some roads which are in a very good shape are again being strengthened or they have been relaid but some roads are left aside why this is happening is that the government gives money but since the network is so vast in india we have so many roads it's very difficult to know exactly which part of the road we have to give the correction so that is where the problem is because of poor management decisions many roads get rehabilitated more often some stretches are never ever considered so the necessity is to identify current payment section that requires timely and appropriate maintenance for which gis remote sensing and gps gets integrated along with payment management data and thus you can come up with correct strategy to know which section of the road should be given immediate attention and where the government money should be put so we have done one analysis for trichy urban road where there are about 19 roads the data is collected for all the 19 roads along each of the roads gps data is collected and um, this is the data that is collected you have road inventory data then that is the data of the road then gps coordinates a simple handheld equipment for collecting the position of the distress where the problem is photographic images and then some payment condition data so this is a simple equipment which we had used this equipment uh, you will get it within 1 lakh uh, and uh, it's a very good equipment it's a surveying equipment you can even get a map of your area and it gives you good accuracy and each the, uh, this is a graph that I mean table that we had created for a certain section of a road every section we are finding out latitude longitude what is the problem along the road what is the severity what is the length and what is the area of each of the problem the lat long again is very important which where we use the gps data uh the photographic images of this distress then it is integrated onto the gis so a gis map is created where the road network map is uh, the road network map extracted from remote sensing the base map again from remote sensing and all that is integrated in the gis platform then this is again using remote sensing all the roads and all that is given the length and all that road is remote sensing and gis then you have this 25 these dots small dots that you see these are the distress points so that is where your gps coordinates are used every section uh, of the road the points have been fixed up and if i click on each one of the point i'll get all the information that is necessary so you have the length the space everything of the point and photograph is again geo tagged using the gps coordinates so this is what it is if i click on to one gps point of this uh, gis map i will get all the information about that along with the photograph all this is tagged only because i have the coordinates which are obtained using the gps equipment once i get all this info i can give a different color so now i have an integration of the remote sensing the gis and the yes ma'am the presentation is not visible ma'am so oh, it's not visible yeah it's visible ma'am it's visible ma'am 
Visible? Okay, okay. Yes, I'm visible. Okay, 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 fine. I uh, still visible. Okay, somebody else is present uh, clicking. I think. Uh, okay, now is it visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It's visible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think someone else had. Uh, I'm getting anything yeah, here. Yes, ma'am. Uh, someone has been someone present. Has, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, sure. Okay, okay. Fine. So, um, if I go back here, yeah, here. Yeah. So, if I have a GPS equipment. Uh, and if I click on to the coordinates, I'll get all this information. All this is possible only if I have these coordinates. That is why we call this as geographic information system. So the G of the GIS is nothing but the latitude longitude, which is again obtained using the GPS. Uh, all that if I integrate, I get all these calculations and all that is done under transportation. Now, all, uh, what I see on the right side is the condition of the road. From red, poor, and all that, I've given a color code. If I so now what I know is that I can know what is the condition of each part of my road. This is again possible only because I have all this integrated system with me, of which GPS is one of the major um, advanced equipment. So see here again which part of the road is good, which part of the road is not good. The green means it is very good. Again. I can know of the same road uh, analysis of different years. I can do the analysis of each of the years. So what was in September 2012, what was in 13, what is in 14. So in two years, I see that some sections of the road are very poor. If you really see the government setup, they will be doing uh, laying here, whereas they should have done it here. So if you give the information correctly to the authorities, they will know which part of the road they should analyze. So this is where our expertise become really important. So you see, this is the structure, which year, what should have been done, what should not have been done. Again, uh, you see the drainage, many roads drainage are very poor. So that again, you can analyze. Compare and see which is good, which is bad. Um, then you can identify which road requires really major rehabilitation and some roads which can be just left aside. So all this is possible if you have an integration of all the systems and you create a very good model. Now, there are many other applications that you can do. Uh, you have land use based urban transportation planning using uh, geospatial techniques. Now, many of the transportation changes take place because of the change in the land use. So how is it getting affected? That can be analyzed by integrating all these three. Lot of impact of transportation can be done on urban land use. Facility based management analysis, like you have a hospital in a certain area. Whether the hospital is catering to the demands of the public over there, or something more is uh, less is required, or more is required. Or if you need to fix up a hospital in a place, whether it is good enough for that area, you can analyze using uh, remote sensing, GIS, and GPS. Travel demand and travel delay analysis using GPS, site suitability analysis, accident analysis, smart city analysis. Smart city is one of the most uh, smartest uh, thing that has come up by the government where uh, these high tech technologies are used. ITS, uh, structural deformation analysis of large engineering structures and many, many, many more in environmental, uh, then uh, in electronics, uh, GPS electronics. Uh, see, the thing with GPS is that being very costly, we cannot open it up and really know what is inside of it. But from the electronics point of view, it can be augmented and you can do a lot of uh, studies. So I would come as a final uh, remark that many of these advanced equipments, including GPS, uh, are finding their applications in many fields nowadays, uh, from point positioning to earthquake engineering, structural engineering, military, land use planning, and all that. They are considered to be more economical and they are less time consuming, less tedious uh, compared to conventional surveying techniques. And uh, they have opened numerous research and developmental activities in my wide area. Many scientific research institutions and universities have taken up this work. And uh, DST, SRO, NRSA, then you have um, many organizations are doing extensive work, Survey of India. And these techniques have become so revolutionized that it will find more and more applications uh, in the future. 
and uh, gps equipments uh, from are again very much used in almost every field be it uh, your uh, phone or be it your laptop or be it google or that uh, it's it's finding its place everywhere and it is revolutionizing everything so so any i think uh, this is it from my side uh, whatever i have tried to mention from my side i have done so so i am open to questions uh, from the audience anyway i hope if anybody has any other queries related to gps they can even email me my email id is given at the last end of the presentation but otherwise they are open to questions uh, now yes thank you from my side yeah this is it thank you ma'am ha ah, yes ma'am ma audible ma'am yeah yeah very much audible please yeah okay dear participants uh, kindly ask if any doubts post in the chat box ma'am doubts are displaying in the chat box ma'am yeah yeah i'll go through that one minute i want to see Ah yeah, one question uh, which has come from the audience is how best the Google Earth extracted GPS points can be used in elevation study. Now, uh, the though I had mentioned that GPS gives you latitude, longitude, and height, GPS has a little uh, see latitude and longitude is very precisely given, but when it comes to the height observation, there. is an error in the sense since i was mentioning that the gps signal has to come through lot of atmospheric observations it gets uh, swayed a bit and there is a little bit of error the height observations are not up to the mark um but the google earth extracted gps points even though you use it it's always better that you validate it with some gps equipment that you have uh height observations i wouldn't suggest gps for uh, analysis because there will be an error if you have some software which can monitor the uh, error well and fine but otherwise uh, not advisable for uh, height uh, elevation study the best equipment that you, you can use for elevation study is total station this is my advice um, gps is not very good in height extraction right so that is one And then uh, possible to share uh, powerpoint slides of course i will share it with the uh, your organizers then for another question is how gps can help earthquake estimation uh, yes see uh, the uh, gps equipments uh, like i was mentioning that there are permanent equipments and semi permanent equipment permanent equipments are that it will be fixed up in the area and it will take observations um, like 24 hours to 365 days a week now today if i have taken one observation it is running i will do calculation i'll get latitude longitude and height for today 10 days later i will take one more observation then again i will get another latitude longitude i will subtract these two observations i will get the two coordinates i will subtract it will give me some value it will be some distance and some direction then i will take another set of observation i will compare these two i will see what is the change in the value if there is going to be a major change in the value or major change in the dire if there is no not going to be any earthquake it will follow the same direction of movement north east or south west or whatever it is it will be always the same direction of movement if there is going to be a different direction of move, ah then one more thing i needed to tell you the coordinates will always follow a quadrant system it will either be in the northeast south the um, uh, northeast northwest southeast so you should know which is the direction which direction it is moving you have to estimate that get the change uh, vector distance and the direction analyze wow, how much is that um, value and the direction in the next observation if you see a slight change in the value then you can understand that something is happening under the surface of the earth the gps will give you only surface observation so likewise i was saying it is like a pressure cooker 
at the bottom it will burn at will come to the top at one point of time it will just burst you can know when your cooker is going to give that uh, shoe out isn't it slowly 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 it will happen like that also earth reacts in that way slowly slowly it will come to the top then the surface starts swaying a bit that sway can be analyzed by the gps equipment when there is a sway in the earth surface the vector value will change its direction the value will the vector value will be either less or more immediately you can say that the earth is showing a peculiar nature and then you can do an earthquake estimation you can only forecast you cannot predict but you can forecast that something is going to happen you can call up the expert of an earthquake and then tell them that okay something is happening in this area you please come and analyze that area so this is one way of doing it so gps is not the only equipment it can be used as one aid that's what i meant okay i think that is all from question any more questions any other questions i saw two i think i have answered also Ah, please explain geo tagging. Ah, uh, see, geo the photographs that we take using our mobile phone and um, the camera. They now there are. Uh, I mean, uh, I guess there are some equipments which do that also. But majority of the cameras and then the mobile phones we take a photo. It only has the time, the time frame. It doesn't have the coordinate. So geo tagging is one software where uh um, you can use that time of your uh, mobile phone or the photo and also the gps time and then augment it and then geo tag it so when you merge it together using those time the coordinate and the photograph gets merged that is what is called geo tagging and uh, there are some specific softwares which you can use you can just check online you will get what is called the geo tag there are equipments but they are equi expensive you have gps cameras with geo tag as well it is a, now it is available in amazon also you can just check that out um, how can we estimate tide height through gps and gps help to estimate tsunami yes estimate no, i wouldn't say estimate tsunami i can maybe forecast whether there is a problem like i just explained to you right now ah like the indian uh, like we had a tsunami in 2004 right now they say that the us had kind of like informed the indian subcontinent that such a problem is happening just based on the igs uh, movement of uh, the plate motion i had shown you the plate motion so if there is a change in the plate motion from its normal like isc is supposed to move at 55 the northeast if it moves differently then you can predict that something is going to happen so the same thing here also you can not i wouldn't say estimate but you can predict that some problem is going to happen now a lot of equipments have been fixed up along the uh, andaman area to do that then estimate high tidal height uh, uh, along the ocean we have those boeings right uh, which are floating on top of the ocean each of these boeings are fitted with gps equipment so small chip that chip information can be extracted you can measure what is the height and uh, today i have the height tomorrow i have the height subtract them if there is any error between the error will get uh, eliminated and you will get the uh, precise height of the uh, gps i mean precise height of the tide so that is how the height is estimated yeah okay any more questions thank you ma'am yeah okay thank you i think i will answer ma'am shall i uh, give a word of thanks yeah sure 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 please go ahead yeah okay ma'am gratitude is the fairest blossom which springs from the soul I would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude to our guest speaker, Dr. Nisha Radha Krishnan, ma'am, for sparing her valuable time for making this session a very meaningful one. Thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, devoting your precious time and uh, 
endowing the young peoples with your uh, words of wisdoms and experience finally i extend my heartfelt gratitude to all the participants for your active participation thank you one and all for your cordial cooperation thank you ma'am thank you so much yeah thank you thank you for this opportunity i would like to thank uh, dr kannan uh, for have given me this uh, opportunity and i actually enjoyed it and thank you the participants for uh, being patient enough to listen to me for such a long time and you have any doubts uh, you can please i'll share the presentation with the uh, coordinators and then you can contact me in the email id that is mentioned uh, in the presentation thank you and have a good day thank you thanks a lot thank you kanan sir thank you ma'am thank you okay then thank you signing off then thank you